The Theosophical Society presents Jeffrey Hudson in a talk entitled Man's Higher Self. We are to consider together such thoughts as I may be able to express about a thought-free existence, a supramental being in one sense, the ego of man in the causal body, the orgoides as the Greeks called it, the self-shining divine fragment. We are encouraged, now even in called by the great ones to pay attention to our own divine selves, to try and find and live according to them, and to explore the infinite potentialities and powers resident within the divine nature of each one of us. There is a short paragraph in the voice of the silence which may well lead into our subject. Avert thy face from world deceptions. Mistrust the senses. They are forms. But within thy body, the shrine of thy sensation, Seek the impersonal for the, seek in the impersonal for the eternal man. Having sought him out, look inward. Thou art Buddha. So here is a field of interior and intuitive research and exploration in which we are encouraged the discovery of the self and the deepening understanding of its nature. In our theosophical teachings, a sharp and clear distinction is made, as you all know, between the bodily personality and the deeper indwelling self, the thinker which is using the brain, the spirit essence, which we sometimes call the ego. Concerning this inner spirit essence, theosophy adds that it is an expression of and inseparably identified with universal spirit essence, the two being one. And that universal spirit is, as it were, focused into an individuality in man. And that's the inner self. An imperfect analogy might be the process of focusing universal sunlight through a reading glass or lens down below until the focus is correct and you have below the lens an intense, individualized, brilliant expression of the universal light. Now it's not two lights, it's one light, but focused by this process. And perhaps, though the analogy is imperfect, that may indicate this fact of our identity as spiritual beings with the spirit of the universe. This, then we go on to learn, this, the spiritual self of each one of us, is relatively immortal. A single truth of immense importance. Only the body dies. If only the world could hear and believe that and a little later learn to know it as a vital, continuing experience of the immortality of the self. Only the body die. The self is relatively immortal relative to the body, 
completely invulnerable and wholly indestructible. And this is the real self of each one of us. For which, as we know, this, the body, with its associated vitality, emotions, and thought power, is, as it were, a vehicle, or if you like, temple, with a God indwelling. Sir Edwin Arnold quotes the Gita thus, It is exhaustless, self-sustained, immortal, indestructible. Weapons reach not the life, flame burns it not, waters cannot overwhelm, nor dry winds wither it, impenetrable, unentered, unassailed, unharmed, untouched, immortal, all arriving, stable, sure, invisible, ineffable. By word and thought uncompassed, ever all itself, thus, he says, is the soul declared. A wonderful and beautiful description, surely, of the inner self of man. We know it has its vesture of light, the Ogoides, the causal body, and therein the indwelling self unfolds its inherent and latent faculties, and power, and knowledge, and wisdom through successive lives on earth, under karma. And the goal adeptship, to become an occult sage. Such, briefly, is one concept given us by theosophy about ourselves, our own immortal selves. Now, I shall attempt from now on to describe something of what causal consciousness is like the life of the ego amongst its peers. Pure causal consciousness of the ego in its own world. This is quite impossible to do. Descriptions are so difficult because conceptual thought and words falsify intuitive and spiritual experience. And what I shall say will be overlaid with words. And I shall be acutely conscious of the fact all the time. But we are together. The ego abides, as I understand it, not in thinking awareness, but intuitive or thought-free, supramental awareness. As dynamic intuition is free of mental processes. Or perhaps I might say, egoic consciousness is beyond the restrictions of rationality. Now that puts the exponent in a very difficult position. So much sympathy will be needed with my halting attempts to describe the indescribable. I can say in terms of thought concepts, however, that in causal consciousness there is a total absence of negatives. Fear, need, loneliness, bereavement, want, cannot find any place in causal consciousness. Only positives exist, can exist at such high frequencies. The ego of man is beyond the sway of the opposites. There every two is one. As at the apex of a triangle, where exists original inseparability and balanced equipoise. 
Also, the ego exists in a state of infinite withinness, as well as our knowledge that the without is infinite. There, there is what I can only refer to as infinite withinness. Now then, I'll proceed. Helped by the fact that I shall be talking about ourselves you and I, as we really are. And as I go along, I hope you will find from within yourself an ascent, as if you'd always known that, as you have, as we have, because it, it's ourselves. We're not talking about some other being. We're thinking about ourselves, and permissibly in this case. Sometimes the consciousness becomes irradiated by the certainty it must be so. Very well then, what is it like? What have you found in your terms as you've attempted this perhaps most valuable of all explorations? Well, the seers and the mystics who have given us their testimony unite in one description, which is the experience is of, is of light, of being light in light, of finding oneself, that follows falsifies the truth, of course, of finding oneself as a center of light in an infinite ocean of light. The two being one, light, all light. The ego, or the spark of interior self-awareness, at that level is, as it were, a center of radiance in an ocean of light. Perhaps the light that never was on sea or land. The true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world as the ego becomes reincarnate in a new personality. But not only light in this sense of reflected light at the physical level, or forth shining light from a source, but interior light, and in addition, enlightenment, such as comes to one on the sudden solution of a problem hitherto insoluble. Suddenly you see it and experience what is sometimes called a moment of truth. Now think of a moment of truth which is perpetual. Another contradiction in terms, I can't avoid them. They will go on to the end of this talk. A moment of truth which is continuous. So we say the ego comprehends. Then there is a poised intensity of consciousness and existence. Almost as of an explosion. At the center of an explosion which is continually occurring. And yet is perfectly calm. Natural, high voltage, shall I say, high intensity, high frequency of the oscillation of consciousness. Like the fire of genius, the, the divine afflatus, which occasionally descends to illumine mind and empower thought and hand and voice to create something which even down here makes of the person an immortal. Well, the ego is perpetually in that state, an immeasurable intensity and center of power. Then, an amazing sense of freedom. You see, there is no vehicle of consciousness to be considered, nothing to operate, nothing to care for, nothing to keep, 
the whole is immortal, eternal, indestructible, self-supplied. So there's no effort of any kind, even possible. This freedom, together with the change from a personal awareness like this to egoic awareness, gives an amazing sense of lightness and freedom. I now, for example, am very conscious of struggling almost impotently in the effort to transfer perceptions into conceptual thinking, which is wrong, into the brain, choose the words as well as I can, and speak. What a lot of machinery I'm having to operate. And you, and you have my sympathy, you chose this subject, uh, are similarly listening. That which cannot ever be heard, because it can never be said. And in fact, we could all be quiet now because there's nothing to be said. We'd better realize it. What did Tennyson say? Let no one ask me how it happened. No, uh, let no one ask me how it came to pass. I only know it happened. That to me, a livelier emerald, twinkles in the grass. A purer sapphire melts into the sea. How rightly he began. Let no one ask me how it happened. Then, and remember, we are in supramental, non-conceptual realms. Absolute trust in life. The question of supply, of direction, of fulfillment, of being guided right, finding your way and what to do next, cannot possibly arise in causal consciousness. Neither can there be any conceived plan of any kind. That would be a denial, a descent into conceptual thinking again. No choices. That's a relief, isn't it? <laughs> Only spontaneous, motive-free existence. But by no means inconsequent. Quite the contrary. There is an intensity of awareness and illumination. But no action has to be decided upon because no action is either necessary or even possible. There is only being, that's all, only existing, which is all sufficient. The thought of more, for example, can't enter into the egoic consciousness because everything's there all the time in fullness. And more suggests absence and that's a negative and can't go there. Just as the medium waves can't be picked up in the short wave, wave bands. As a result, the ego abides in complete and ever undisturbable serenity based upon oh, these words based upon certainty. Now you see, certainty suggests thought and knowledge and studying the situation and coming to the conclusion that all is well. The, all is ever well and cannot ever be anything else in the inner consciousness of each one of us and for you all and for me and for our fellow men. Nothing can ever harm us, ever. And all that we can ever need is perpetually available in fullness from an inexhaustible supply. And if we want to bring dimension into it, which is wrong again, it all wells up within us. It is our very self. So therefore we can't think about it. It's there. This brings a kind of unarguable, absolute self-assurance, 
which is selfless or not a thought concept. Then the time sense on entering causal consciousness is completely changed. There is no time in our sense there but perhaps duration which means continuing time. Time without limits. It's going on forever without thought of ever. Take for example this meeting. Another imperfect analogy. Well we knew it was going to happen some time ago and we? we had to think about it. And then gradually we began to gather here in the process and passing of time. We got here and we gradually took our places and the music called us to order and the president called upon me with his kind words and then I got up to speak and I'm still speaking to you and you are there and the whole thing's going on and it will go on for another half hour and so on and on. And it's all one thing, one experience. It will, it's a continuum. Causal consciousness, yes, abides in a time continuum. Our past lives, for example, they aren't past lives to the ego at all. It's true, we came out of the lobby there and up here, but you can't call that much in the past. So, our former lives, wherever they were, England, Middle Europe, Rome, Greece, Egypt, the east or far back into Atlantis, as we say, down here. A million or more years ago, perhaps. All this is still going on, Diego, as this meeting is still going on, without the necessity of any time concept at all. Past lives are going on now. There is, in fact, only now. Only one moment, this one. It's always now in causal consciousness. Nothing can ever be old, for example. There's no coming on, arriving and going and disappearing and parting and finish. Thank goodness. The glories of life and the bliss which can be born in the heart is never lost. Doesn't come to a frustrated, often pain giving in. No. One can see why people choose and seek this inner time free state where bliss alone abides. And so this experience of entering into causal consciousness is ever fresh, is ever new, as if it were the first time like a wonderful spiritual spring, might I say, which goes on forever. See, there's another denial. Goes on. You mustn't talk about goes on in causal consciousness. Everything's here. There's nowhere to come from, nowhere to go. All is here and now. All is one. One is all. All here. Here, ness. Now-ness. Feel causal consciousness. So there's no room for anything else. It's the natural state. There is no movement then because space limitations can't exist. There's no geography in causal consciousness. No distance, of course. That suggests a negative. Somewhere which isn't here. No distance. No measurement. Not even the concept of measurement can enter into causal consciousness. There is only what someone, I forget whom, has described as the adjacence of everywhere. All here. All is one. One is all. And all beings are one. Don't say, we mustn't say all beings are one being. All beings are one. Finish. So there's a kind of limitlessness which we can't know down here really, save perhaps when we gaze into the immeasurable depths of space. All 
is limitless in time dimension and it's instinctual not conceptual it's just there that's all naturally there is a non-rationalized totally unemotional intense happiness serene bliss in causal consciousness and for some the first touch is the dis- descent or p- the pervading of the personal nature of a serene ecstasy for which there are no words which sometimes we may experience in our highest moments uplifted by an event in life and as we heard this morning an abiding sense of oneness many have attempted to describe this indescribable ness marcus aurelius wrote in his diary enter into every man's inner self and let every man enter into thine and our familiar quotation from John Donne seems to me to describe and to come from pure causal consciousness any man's death diminishes me because i am involved in mankind he wrote and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee and one of your great american poets right of the penetrate the burning one binding everything now those that phrase was conceived i suggest and those words formulated and written in a flash a blinding flash of egoic realization all is one and one is all now this can have a any special application to ourselves as theosophists all of this is applicable to our daily lives but i haven't time to go into it it's fairly obvious however those who feel devoted to and aspire to one of the great masters of the wisdom by entering into the causal concept of life and being and existence can realize that the master is not far away in tibet himalayas the valley of the nile or elsewhere so far away no is within you as another occult saying go because the atma in the self is one with the atma in all others and so there's one atma so that the great and revered mahatmas who founded our movement and whose names we in whose names we are now at this moment gather together doing their work for their society and there within us in our atmic and even buddhic and causal selves we have with them an unbreakable link of unity forever there there indeed the whole hierarchy of earth adepts the glorious and august assembly of the just men made perfect rank upon rank guiding our destiny and that of all life obedient to law all of this is part of you part of me part of every man the more the potentiality of that whole hierarchy is part of the potentiality of every monad as it were expresses itself in increasing fullness in every individuality to bring each one to the same condition of fully realized intensely intimate 
spiritual identity. So the masters are within you. And the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now I've been trying to describe the kingdom of heaven as it happens, yes, perhaps. Yes, and the kingdom of heaven can be taken by storm. There is, in fact, very little, if any, sense of I-ness in, even in causal consciousness. But when the higher, or rather I should more correctly say, deeper levels of human existence, as one penetrates to the core of the nature of man, to that inexhaustible wellspring of power, life, and consciousness, which he is, the nearer one comes to total absence of I-ness and cons complete self-identity with all. This, of course, can filter down into the personality of man as non-possessiveness, generosity, the unparaded, the multitude of the unparaded charities of men and the sense of stewardship for all one possesses. There you have the dawning of causal consciousness in the brain, in the mind and in the motives for living and giving. Unforced, just spontaneous sharing. Because that, that denies causal consciousness because there can't be sharing. That's a physical, con mento physical concept of some, some other person existing. There aren't any others. Or is one. That also is very helpful in daily life, you know. Utter impersonality. If there's nobody ever there, there's nobody to be heard. And if, it's, if we are ever suffering, I'm not preaching or presuming to preach, but if we are ever hurt, it's because we are conscious of ourselves. There's a little saying of this, where two people who have evidently had some kind of realization are talking, and one says, have you ever been snubbed? And the other one says, yes, many times, but it never bothered me because I was never there. Great secret. Great secret of happiness. Serenity. It's the heart of all the teachings on those subjects. I-lessness. Self-forgetfulness. No, that's, of course, that's falsifying it. Self-transcendence is the secret of happiness. Two other of these uh, non-selves met, if I might lighten this a moment. One said, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Good, there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they would banish us, you know. So, the ego of I in an instinctual, non-rationalized state of unity, identity, non-distinction. It's as if you are in the presence of something which is common to everything, like the common denominator in mathematics. Somebody has called it suchness. The ego abides in the suchness of existence, its own and other people's, and that of the universe. Or as they say, the tattva, the thatness of manifested, manifested things. Then, of course I would like to stop there, but I haven't time and say how important that realization of oneness is to humanity at the moment. No organizations, 
no summit talk would ever be necessary and will ever be necessary if and when a sufficient number of human beings have this dawning and later deepening sense that all life is one. All beings are one. And that every human being belongs to one spiritual family which is without distinctions of any kind. That's, that's how world peace will ultimately come as a final state of hu human civilization. Not from without, not even in obedience to morality, but because there is no other path at all to go. The ego is also pervaded by a restful stillness, strange though this may seem. A dynamic stillness, a complete tranquility, which can never be even invaded, certainly never destroyed. And so the teaching goes upon which I am drawing. It is in this silence and tranquility of mind that the, the self-declaration of the Spirit occurs in utter silence. It is known, it is experienced, it is there in completeness. If there's any action of mind at all, it would be to utter the words, O Thou, as the Divine Presence, if you like, declared itself in light and glory and blessing and serenity and bliss to this the mortal man plunged in abstracted contemplation well there is so much more and everything to be far more truly said. But there I must draw this statement or list to a close. I might perhaps, as I do so, refer to methods whereby the experience can be attained. No royal road, I suppose, because each one of us will find our own way to the heart of being. Perhaps the way within which we live and from which in involution a ray of the ego, monad, emerged. Each of us, our own road. But we can say, can't we, in general principle, that in our consciousness and self-realization can be gained by regular, prolonged contemplation. And the use by the mind as springboards of potent and dynamic affirmations of eternal verities. From the verity, which after all is a concept, perhaps the mind may leave the concept altogether. It can fall away, leaving the mind still, while something else in one, the spirit in one, abides, illumined in unity with that which the affirmation Affirm. And of course, in addition, as much as possible, must then be expressed in motive and conduct of daily life. Of surely it can be of little value to contemplate the eternal in the period of meditation and to conceive of unity 
and then to go out and deny unity and brotherhood in daily life. That, that will never lead to the fullness of realization, surely. But it seems, um, as we are, we men and women of the world, we must give ourselves up to periods of mental stillness. Then the inner experience will filter in, as it were, from within, become revealed with all its supramental, effort-free states of life and freedom spiritual bliss. Here and I'll close with one or two such affirmations. I, the aspirant can say, I'm not speaking of myself, I am rooted in the eternal. I am divine fearless, free and full of joy. That's useful when the pressures of life and the mortality of the flesh and the infidelity of loved ones and perhaps major and minor catastrophes bring sorrow to soul and body Try and rise above them and realize I am divine, fearless, free and full of joy. Stay there as long as possible. I am, here's another one, I am self-shining, pure being. If you let the mind be still, with that, as it were, at the center, the new state can be entered. I and my Father are one. The self in me, the Atma, is one with the self in all, the Paramatma. I am that, that am I. Keep on, keep on with that. Sooner or later, the fact of it will either dawn in a blinding flash of realization or gradually become realized in an amazing harmonization of one's whole being. Of course, the mantra, O Hidden Light, is very wonderful indeed as an expression of this fact of unity in which amidst so much else all being but components of a single state of awareness the inner self of you and I and all our fellows perpetually abide.